Good afternoon and welcome to the December board meeting of the UW System Board of Regents. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Grebe? Here. Regent Atwell? Here. Regent Bechtel? Regent Delgado? Here. Regent Hall? Here. Regent Jones? Here. Regent Klein? Here. Regent Lezzo? Here. Regent Menides? Here. Regent Mueller? Here. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Plant? Here. Regent Stanford Taylor? Here. Regent Tiedemann? Here. Regent Walsh? Here. Regent Whitburn? Here. Regent Woodmansey? We have a quorum. Thank you. Before we consider items on today's agenda, are any board members here who wish to declare conflicts of interest regarding any items on the open session agenda? Hearing none, let's move forward. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Before we get started, I'd like to expend a extend a special uh, a thank you to Chancellor Watson and your team for your warm Warhawk hospitality. Thank you. Wait. Thank you. We've only been here about six hours, but we've covered quite a bit of ground. Uh, it's very much appreciated. We've got a lot going on here, and we look forward to learning more both today and tomorrow. <clears throat> At this point, we're going to shift our focus <clears throat> to opening remarks from President Cross, and I will um, share the mic with him now, where he can talk about our uh, meeting's uh, uh, plan of uh, record. President Cross. Um, thank you. Uh, as you probably know, we have been identifying a theme for each board meeting and this time here in Whitewater our theme is inspiring and I think by the time we're through today you will agree that what Wisconsin <coughs> UW Wisconsin and Whitewater is doing is inspiring so over my four decades in higher education as well as here within the UW system I've frequently frequently been struck by the inspiring work that happens every day on college campuses. I continue to be inspired by the passion of faculty and staff who serve students throughout this life-changing experience. And I'm inspired by the research that is so creatively and diligently pursued by the brilliant minds on our UW campuses all around the state. <clears throat> I'm inspired by the curiosity that drives the overall pursuit of knowledge in our halls, in our labs, and of course, the noble pursuit of truth. And I am inspired by our students who invest in their own futures by coming to college. We met several of them this morning and you're going to see some more from Kara to Casey, Odell, Alex, several of you I've been talking to, known several of you for several years. I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by the contributions these students are making to our communities. And you're gonna hear some of that in a few minutes. Everything we do is to improve the human condition, which is a noble and yes, inspiring ambition. In our time here at UW-Whitewater, we will hear stories that should inspire us further. So let me point out just a few. The individual journeys taken by our students at UW-Whitewater, 41% of students are first-generation college students. Now just imagine how many others they inspire. <clears throat> There's also the work being done to keep our academic programming relevant to the interests and needs of our students and of course the state. In the Education Committee this morning, Regents approved a variety of new programs, including in-demand programs in environmental science, conservation, information systems management, human performance, as well as others. We also heard the annual report from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health about work being done to address the state's complex health challenges. On the way out this morning, Dean Golden told me about today, a world-breaking, first-of-its-kind effort to deal with issues related to kidney problems in <clears throat> transplants and how they've isolated that through immunology. Today, that's taking place first human clinical trial. Tomorrow we'll hear about the, ed the educational opportunities advanced by <coughs> the extended campus, just one part of UW system's significant efforts to attract and serve non-traditional students in Wisconsin. All in all, there are countless stories, both individually 
and collectively that lead us to believe that higher education can inspire all of us to a better future. And yes, you've heard me say it before, all of this is happening in Wisconsin. President, uh, Region President uh, Peterson. Thank you, President Krause. One of the best parts about taking our region show on the road is the opportunity it gives us to learn more about the great campuses that make up the UW system and how each of them, in their own unique way, is meeting the needs of our state. Here to share UW Whitewater's inspiring story is our host, Chancellor Dwight Watson. Chancellor Watson. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to this beautiful campus at UW-Whitewater. This is, can you all hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity for our campus, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves thus far. I'd like to offer a special welcome to the Board, board President Peterson and other Board Regents, President Cross, my fellow Chancellors, leaders from campuses across the UW system, students, faculty, and staff from our sister campuses, governance <laughs> leaders, and all of those who call UW-Whitewater home. <coughs> I also stand, extend a warm welcome to community members who have taken the time to join us. You'll note the Wordle. This Wordle slide was created this summer and early fall when we asked members of the community to submit <coughs> one word that summarizes their feelings about UW-Whitewater. <coughs> This graphic was created to highlight the words that came through most often. Words like opportunity, community, and family are prominent, but so are words like inclusive and welcoming. I'm learning that all of these values are deeply woven into the fabric of this excellent community. I am humbled and honored to be the 17th chancellor of this illustrious university. I'm not only proud, but also truly excited that I'm able to join the UW-Whitewater community in our 151st year of changing lives and influencing the future. <laughs> As you will find out today, we are surely not resting on our past. We continue to inspire, engage, and transform the lives of faculty, students, and staff in the community, the state, the region, and the world. Last year, Dr. Anthony Gulick, an associate professor in the history department who specializes in Native American studies, approached the Native American Cultural Awareness Association about creating a land acknowledgement statement. One of the students, Cody Wing, took the suggestion to heart and began working with Dr. Kenny Yarborough, our Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer, to create a statement which has been endorsed by the Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council. Today is the inaugural reading of that statement. I would ask Dr. Yarborough to join me now and share the statement. Good afternoon. As we gather here for the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents meeting, we acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin Whitewater exists today on the traditional lands of many native peoples. We welcome the duty and opportunity in sharing stewardship of these lands. While this state institution has a rich history, for thousands of years, this region and these lands were home to diverse native peoples. And the knowledge and understanding of this history 
we acknowledge that the land on which the University of Wisconsin Whitewater now exists was and remains the historic and traditional territory of many native peoples. The Ho-Chunk grew corn and gathered a living from these lands. The Potawatomi, then closely related to the Ojibwa and Odawa people, called this land home as well. We welcome and are honored by the responsibility to be good stewards of these lands and good neighbors to all Wisconsin indigenous populations. In concert with the Native American Cultural Awareness Association, Native students, with faculty and staff, the university continues to explore durable and meaningful ways of acknowledging our relationship. We recognize these great Native nations and their respective sovereignties and are thankful to be positioned in such a prominent, historic, and meaningful landscapes as we continue to provide educational opportunities for all whom the university serves. I want to thank Cody Wing, who has since graduated Dr. Gulick and Dr. Yarborough for their work on this important acknowledgement. UW-Whitewater continues to celebrate its 150 years as an institution of higher learning through May 2020. In May, we celebrate 150 years of, com of commencement ceremonies. A part of the 150th anniversary, we completed a successful fundraising campaign in which we raised $17 million exceeding the $15 million goal. UW-Whitewater received the largest bequest to date, a $5 million estate gift from alumnus Chris Chrisman. Chris, who received his Bachelor's of Science degree in business in 1959, previously donated $1.5 million in 2015 to help construct the Mary Poppy Chrisman Success Center, bringing his total actual and pledged contributions to more than $6.5 million the most of any individual donor to the university. I had the honor of spending some time with Chris and his wife, Carlene. Chris shared with me the impact that UW-Whitewater had on him as a student and how the campus continues to affect his life. Again, we are grateful for all that the Christmas had done for our, has done for our university. The Catchell family has also been extremely generous to UW-Whitewater. They have given more than $8 million to the campus. The Catchells support the arts, athletics, academic programs, and scholarships. The Catchell family had a major impact on this university. We are grateful for their continuous generosity and support. This past Tuesday, we held the Day of Giving, in which money was raised for the Warhawk Emergency Fund. The Emergency Fund helps students who are in critical financial systems situations. We just recently found out that on that day of giving, last Tuesday, we raised $31,000. We are grateful to all of our donors. They are critical to the success of UW-Whitewater. Now I'd like to share some data points that demonstrate the ways we have impacted students' lives throughout our history. This campus enrolled women from the moment we opened in 1868. Inclusion has been a value since the beginning. In 1973, UW-Whitewater was given a priority mission to provide exemplary services to students with disabilities. This is a mission we continue to fulfill daily. We currently have more than 1,130 students who self-identify as having a disability and request services from the Outstanding Center for Students with Disabilities. The intercollegiate athletic teams and individual student athletes have won 83 national championships, including 2014, when our Warhawks, for the first time in NCAA history at any level, won national championships in football, men's basketball, and baseball. The wheelchair basketball athletes have won 16 national championships and the rugby team has won four national championships. And this fall, six of our eight fall NCAA teams won their conference championships. 
Here are some additional data points. We are proud that students receive their instruction from academic professionals who choose to be in the classroom as well as conduct research. We are proud that UW-Whitewater is the national leader in the Association of American Colleges and University, the LEAP initi initiative. LEAP, or Liberal Education in America's Promise, champions the importance of a liberal education for students and for a nation dependent on economic creativity and de democratic vitality. We are, part, we are proud that we are, we are along with strong, we have strong academic programs. We know that student organizations enhance students' learning, and there are 217 student organizations available to students. We are proud to continue to graduate students and send them out into communities to build their lives. And employees tell us that they hire UW-Whitewater students because of their great skills and their work ethic, and that they are, and that they are workforce ready. Students get good jobs or go on to further their education at prestigious graduate schools. For the, for the third year in a row, we've been named among the colleges of distinction. We are proud of all of these accolades. This Regents meeting is notable because UW-Whitewater is the first of the receiving campuses to host the Board of Regents. When the announcement was made to pair UW-Whitewater with UW-Rock County, there was much excitement about the prospect of bringing the two campuses together. Over the course of the two years since the announcement, much work has been done to make the transition as seamless as possible, especially for our students. That work continues. Today, we are proudly UW-Whitewater and UW-Whitewater at Lock County. We have a, vi a video that will explain much of the work that has been accomplished. You will recognize that the the Whitewater and Rock County campuses are keenly focused on our shared values. Our shared values are collaboration, diversity and opportunity, integrity, learning and academic excellence, service and social responsibility, and shared governance. We have students from the branch campus living in the residence hall at the main campus. We offer that benefit the first year of restructuring and about 20 students participated. This year, we are pleased to have 73 of our 865 Rock, Rock County students living in residence halls on the Whitewater campus and taking a free shuttle between the campuses. This seemingly small step deeply embeds Rock County students on this campus, giving them a fuller university experience. We hope the experience leads those students to completing their four-year degree at UW-Whitewater. I'd like to now share a video that highlights how we are even better together. Our challenges that we faced were what is going to change in my everyday life. But the challenge that we end up finding is what else are we going to be able to see through our education? What new doors are going to be open? The Rock County campus has always had a really important mission has been about access and that's something that many four-year institutions haven't had to think about in the same way and so maintaining that idea that we are here for anybody wherever you're coming from is important to us. The goal there was to preserve our campus culture. It's closer to a family than it is to what would feel like a workplace. Sometimes when there's obstacles or challenges, when you put the students first, 
people can see um, what the right decision should be. Right from the beginning, the commitment to student success at Whitewater was really clear. And so while we're serving different students, uh, we have different kinds of programs, everybody really wants to see students succeed. So the staff and the faculty who we were interacting with, really that's what they valued, so they were willing to listen more to what it would take to serve the students here. How is it different? Immediately we found common ground where we had focus on student success. We had a joint meeting between our two student governments to talk about what are our main priorities. And they're all the same. My number one priority was making sure that we weren't forcing how we function at UW-Whitewater on Rock County. Really taking the approach of listening, understanding what's going to work for the students, what's going to make sense for the staff that supports the students. Everything was moving very fast, um, and so communication was key. Thinking about admissions and enrollment and even marketing and university relations, the conversation came down to what is the best for the student every time. The slogan, Even Better Together, was developed really shortly after the restructuring announcement, and I think that attitude carried through with each staff member. These two campuses have a lot of great assets, and we're going to put this whole thing together into a larger family. But we needed to introduce our branding and identity to the Rock County campus, so we put the Warhawk head in the gym, we welcomed to the Warhawk family, um, we changed the signage on campus, uh, we put purple everywhere we could, we put banners up. Even just changing the colors, changing the material that was around so that students knew who they were now and what that meant for their opportunities. And they are affectionately known as you rock locally so we wanted to preserve that and we started to put together a social media campaign of lively fun upbeat videos built around the hashtag you rock here we did the billboard campaign it tied into the social media campaign just the idea of being branded UW Whitewater was already changing the vibe of students with disabilities at rock and one of our big asks was to have a disability service coordinator at the rock campus and that position was filled and hired by February of 2019. The direction on our campus that I think is different than any other in the system was that we were going to become one. As I think back to even the student government at Whitewater came for a visit and they did a walk around campus to see how could the students here engage more on the main campus. I think there's some collaborative opportunities for things like projects with students between campuses potentially. In addition to that, we've integrated the hot card system so that students can use the hot card here as well as at Whitewater. Our Rock County students are able to come to Whitewater's campus and utilize health services. This academic year, we have our new textbook rental and bookstore up and running over at Rock County. We're not going to take anything away. We're going to add things. One of the things that we added was the shuttle system that goes between campuses. So we have this semester about 70 students who are going to school at Rock but living at the Whitewater campus and then they take the shuttle back and forth to take their classes. To have the Whitewater residential experience for students with disabilities that's huge because accessible housing is hard to find. And I will give a special shout out right now to the registrar's office because I can't even fathom what it took for them to build an entire new curriculum in and then try to figure out how students register all of the levels and they were understaffed already. Our most difficult procedure I think that we worked through was students transitioning from Rock to UW-Whitewater, so basically moving from their associate degree to their bachelor's degree. And how were we going to handle that? What items did we want them to take care of before they came? How would we transition advising, et cetera. One thing that Rock brought to Whitewater was the thought of on-ramps and off-ramps to education. That's where the future of education lies. We don't know where the next great idea is going to come from, and we need to create more avenues for people to have access. It's not just about enrollment for enrollment's sake. It's to say that we have so many students in this state who need access to education for the betterment of their careers, for better salaries for whatever it is that they need also just to be better people right and when that's the goal then the opportunities are just infinite
as you can see, collaboration is one of our values. People came together and focused on student success throughout the process. We believe there are more opportunities for us to forge even stronger bonds between the campuses, including offering new academic programs and expanding our outreach and recruitment to the Rock County communities, such as Janesville and Deloitte. I encourage each of you to attend our reception on the Rock County campus this evening, which will start at 530. At the reception, we will sign an MOU with Platteville, focusing on our engineering program. So I'll see you this evening, I hope. We know that our campuses impact our students' lives in deep and meaningful ways. We also know that this university has a significant economic impact as well. Dr. Ruck, Russ Kaysen is the director of the Fiscal and Economic Research Center on campus. He and his colleagues have done an excellent job on integrating students into all of their research. You may have been interviewed by one of those students at a regional event, such as Lacrosse Oktoberfest or Irish Fest or or Milwaukee's Lakeside Festival Park. Today, Dr. Kaysen and student research employee Tara Bennett, a UW-Whitewater at Rock County graduate and current UW-Whitewater senior, will share the results of the two studies, the economic impact on UW-Whitewater and the value of UW-Whitewater's degree. Dr. Kaysen and Tara. Thank you, thank you, Chancellor. Um, Tara Bennett is a, uh, a treasure to have at our university. She came here from UROC, and she's now a Warhawk. And there's a certain rhyme there, and I'll introduce Tara Bennett. You rock. <laughs> Hello, so I'm Kara Bennett. Like he said, I am a graduate of UROC. Um, that was actually before the merger, so I get the red diploma still, so I'll have a red one and a purple one. <laughs> Um, so I studied under Dr. Jones at UROC. Um, he's the econ business professor there, and he encouraged me to pursue a degree in econ, and I'm really glad I did because it brought me to the FERC, and I learned a lot there. I learned things like persistence, communication, analytical skills, and all those skills um, helped me to be able to come and present and be a part of the economic impact of Whitewater. So the ultimate goal of that project was to determine our university's impact um, economically on the Tri-County region, which consists of um, Walworth, Jefferson, and Rock Counties. In our study to come up with these numbers, we used um, impact analysis for planning, also known as in-plan. So it's an input-output method where you input X amount of dollars and it outputs jobs, wages, and taxes. Um, as you can see up there, UW-Whitewater has a substantial impact on our local economy. We generate $514.9 million, which creates or supports 4,480 jobs. So how did we come up with that many jobs if the university employs around 1,200? We broke our study up into multiple components of the university, including operations, student spending, um, young auditorium camps, and the athletic department. And we um, came up with that the university operations alone contributes or supports 3,600 of those 4,400 jobs, making them the largest contributor to the economic growth in our community. I think it's really important to note this um, because without the university and all of its components, we wouldn't have this big of an impact. If we didn't have the athletic department, we wouldn't draw in extra people from around the state or different states to stay at the hotel, and we wouldn't have, if we didn't have UROC campus, we wouldn't have those extra students spending their money at the local coffee shop in Janesville. <coughs> and then for um, student spending, we alone generate $84.3 million, which supports 584 jobs. Now that we took on UROC campus, they actually add an additional 54 jobs to that. These jobs, when we create these jobs, those employees go and spend more money, which creates more jobs. And this is known as the multiplier effect. And our in-plan multiplier for this study is 1.8, which is a really good number. Um, it means that for every dollar that we spend in the economy, $1.80 gets recirculated back. With all of that being said and showing the impact of the $514.9 million and how the university generates $23.1 million in state revenue um, or state tax revenue including the local taxes, the um, 
property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes, it's clear to see that we have a really large impact on the economy, and that's really important for all of you to know because <coughs> I think you should really be proud and the university should really be proud of everything that they do do for our Tri-County region. If you take a quick look at the notes in your packet, you'll see also the added value of the university degree, which we also calculated, which was that our average graduate from UW-Whitewater is making almost $74,000, and that the incremental value of the university that surpasses that of simply a high school degree produces another $57 million in tax revenue for the state. Thank you very much. Thank you for your outstanding work and for helping us to quantify not only the impact of the university on, on the region, but also the value of the bachelor's degree that our students earn. We know UW-Whitewater's impact is felt in numerous ways. For instance, the most recent report for the Department of Public Instruction shows UW-Whitewater awarded 663 teaching licenses in 2016 and 17. That's more than any other university in Wisconsin. We were founded as a teacher's college, and that legacy continues to expand each year. Now I'd like to invite Interim Dean of the College of Education and Professional Studies, Dr. Robin Fox, Dr. Tracy Scheer, Professor of Psychology from the College of Letters and Sciences, two-time alum and principal of Whitewater Unified School District, Lincoln Elementary, Mary Kaler, to speak about practicing what we teach. Thank you very much. It's truly an honor to be here to represent the College of Education and Professional Studies along with our colleagues in Letter and Sciences and the principal from the local el elementary school. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about practicing what we teach. Uh, so in the fall of 2011, the principal at Lincoln Elementary asked me to come over and provide some professional development for the teachers as they were moving into an inquiry-based developmental learning and teaching model I shared with the principal that I didn't think what the teachers needed was a lecture from me or sitting and getting from somebody else. What they really needed was time, time to reflect, time to talk to each other, and time to make plans for change in their teaching. I offered a plan for giving teachers some of their time. The plan was simple. A team of the faculty and staff from the College of Education Professional Studies would come to the school one Friday morning a month and be the substitute teachers in the classroom. The real teachers at the school were a little skeptical of the plan. They wondered why we would do something like this. My answer was simple. We needed to recognize the need for teachers to have time to reflect on their teaching when they made a significant change in their curriculum. After a couple of years of the Practicing What We Teach program, our wonderful marketing team wrote an article about the program and it caught the attention of Dr. Tracy Scher. She is somebody who teaches in school psychology, the master's program. She contacted me and asked if I would be open to talking to her about allowing her students to be a part of the program. And so I'd like to introduce Dr. Scher and she can tell you how they got involved. Thank you, Robin, and hello. Um, our future school psychologists come to us with backgrounds typically in psychology, not in education, but it's essential that they get classroom experience in order to be able to consult with teachers um, about solving students' academic and behavioral challenges. And through the Practicing What We Teach program, they get that opportunity, and it can be very eye-opening for them to see three and four of us struggle to manage what a classroom teacher is expected to do on a daily basis. Now, the benefit of this program is not just to our graduate students. It's also to our faculty who participate as university or as classroom substitute teachers. Um, in addition to being a professor, I'm a licensed school psychologist. So I love to have time with children in classrooms. And through that experience with practicing what we teach, 
I also then glean additional examples that I can use in my classrooms with my graduate students. So what does trauma look like in a school setting? What does poverty look like in a school setting? What does sound literacy instruction look like in a classroom? Um, the other thing is that we've appeared, I think, human to our students through participation in this program. We're showing them that we're willing to do the work that we're asking them to do, um, including recess duty. <laughs> um, and finally, admissions is always on our minds. Fortunately, the school psychology program doesn't seem to have difficulty attracting applicants. In fact, we have more than we can accept which is noteworthy in this time of shortages of school psychologists and mental health professionals in our state and in the nation. But we are trying to attract more diverse applicants. And one of the things that our applicants repeatedly report to us is that this program and others like it that allow them to get into classrooms working with children right away um, in their time here is what attracts them to come. And I'm going to introduce now Mary Kyler, the principal of Lincoln Elementary School. Thank you for having me. And I bring with you my elementary cold that I've shared with numerous students. Um, but as Dr. Fox talked about, she asked that I come in and express a, four bullet points um, of what this program means to us. And that was difficult because the benefit is many to all of our staff and all of our students. But the first one is time and collaboration. And the gift of time and collaboration for data analysis and instructional practice to our teaching staff is truly valuable to us. Teachers are able to create teams within grade levels or across grade levels to meet and to collaborate. And those formations allow us to really meet the learner where they're at. So that was the first bullet point about um, how that means, what that means to our staff. The second one was just instructional practice. As I talked about with the time, to, to impact and time to, to do that. It impacts through that collaboration, through the partnership, we find a win-win. The university teams, as Dr. Sher talked about, get hands-on experience in real time with our learners. But Lincoln Elementary teachers are gifted the time to delve deeper into their instructional practice and how they can reteach, how they can look at data to inform that instructional practice. The third gift that we're given by this program is reflection. And too often an education profession is the ability to actually reflect on our teaching practice, to set goals for future student and teacher growth. This collaboration affords the time to teachers to reflect and recharge that learning environment. Teachers simply take time to assess their strategies and the impact that they're having on the learning. This reflection and data analysis allows teachers to set new goals and change some instructional practices to benefit all of our learners. And then finally, this collaboration between teachers and the university staff and pre-service psychology students fosters those positive relationships in our Whitewater Learning community. Elementary education and higher education teams working together to foster a love of learning in our students is a gift that is often unacknowledged. Students viewing colleges and universities with familiarity only fosters a love of lifelong learning. And frankly, in some ways, this helps our students to view their future in a different light, a new light. The connections can be impactful to even our most fragile learners. So these are just some additional impacts of the program. Um, the cost of the half-day subs, we've estimated to be about $25,000, which I'm not sure of any public school that could make that investment easily, and especially a school the size of Lincoln Elementary. Uh, four to 5,000 hours of volunteering. It's led to small grants, publications, and presentations, um, international presentations, as a matter of fact. Um, for those provosts, in the room, if any of your colleges of education want to talk about how this could be replicated uh, near you, we'd be happy to do that. It's very easy. It costs nothing to do, and yet it's a really reciprocal experience. And it's led to cross-college and community collaboration. Um, last year, the three of us, along with others from um, UW-Whitewater, published a book about adoption. And I'm not sure that would have happened if we hadn't had this collaboration first. 
So I'm thankful to UW-Whitewater for continuing to support this work and allowing me to take off one Friday a month to go into the elementary school and to work with the community, the children, and the families. Thank you. President Kloss, I was inspired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. What an outstanding program. This collaborative effort provides release time for our city's teachers and allow our faculty to see firsthand the joys and challenges of teaching in today's complex classroom. As a former elementary and kindergarten teacher, I look forward to participating in practicing what we teach in the spring semester. Another point of... <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Another point of pride is that UW-Whitewater has the largest enrollment of an accredited school of business in the state of Wisconsin. We recently held a meeting with about, about 60 bank presidents from the region. We asked how many were UW-Whitewater alums. More than half of those in the room raised their hands. Recently I met with an alum who works for the accounting firm Baker Tilly in Janesville and she reported that last year alone they hired 12 of our accountants. The business college's beginnings are grounded in our founding as a teacher's college. The business education program grew and changed over our 150 years into the dynamic college of business and economics of today. Today we will hear from Dr. Todd Lashine, an associate professor of occupational safety in our college of business and economics. He along with alumni Siobhan Cook will share with you how we are helping to shape the future for safety professionals. Just started muting those all the way. Reach that age. I want to thank you all for giving me an opportunity to talk about our great uh, degree program here at UW-Whitewater and your privilege to hear about the best kept secret in Wisconsin and that is the occupational safety degree we have. Also, the safety field. Um, many of you, if you see the term occupational safety and health, you probably think OSHA. That is a very like small part of what we do, um, and I'm going to talk about that here. As you can see up on the screen here, uh, we are unique. Uh, probably a lot of degree programs here at the university have as many as 31 different degrees at different universities and campuses. We are just one of 31 GSP qualified or accredited. What that basically means is the Board of Certified Safety Professionals has deemed us worthy to give our students a designation upon graduation. And it's a fast track to achieving the Certified Safety Professional designation, which is the highest basic license you can get in our field. We're also one of 20 ABET, ASEC accredited. ABET is typically reserved for engineering programs. ASEC is applied sciences. So we're part of a very elite group of, pro of degrees that have achieved this high status. Did I flip? Just a few years ago, we came out with a completely online Master's of Science degree in Environmental Safety and Health. It again is elite and one of very few in the country. Now there are more that are popping up, but ours is, is, is also BCSP uh, accredited or qualified, so our graduate students also get the GSP. What's unique about our graduate program, it was designed for the working professional who stumbled into, pun intended, uh, the safety profession, to give them legitimacy and to also teach them the basic scientific inquiry methodology, which actually makes you a better safety professional. Next slide, please. As you can see from our enrollment, it's not bad. It's not the biggest on the campus. But we, could, we could actually use a few more. Our graduation rates are very good. Um, our students really have to buckle down in the final years of their degree program. Next slide, please. One of the strengths of the program is our internship program, and that is that students must complete what we call a capstone internship in their final semester before they get their degree. This is, a, this is an immersed learning experience, which it's heavily supervised. They have to create a portfolio, and they gain a lot of experience. Um, and it's been very successful. In fact, we're the envy of most safety degree programs in the nation because we wrote the book chapter on uh, internships and co-ops. And there's a, there's a copy under all of your chairs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, one thing that I, I took over the internship coordinator position five years ago, and I just traded off to a colleague of mine. But what I did is I wanted students to get their own internships because I wanted them to gain that experience to apply 
an interview and then decide which one they wanted. I've also pushed for non-capstone internships. These are internships that students doesn't involve the university at all. They go out to get it for experience. I've pushed that very hard for the last five years and I'm very proud to announce that this last summer we had 50 undergraduate students do internships for non-credit. That's amazing. That's almost a third of the students enrolled. That is going to carry over to additional internships, and then when they go for their capstone, they can target it to a company they want to work for. That's going to drive up our pre-graduation placement even higher. And as you can see from the screen here, our students are, are earning very high internship wages. And by the way, this is conservative. If I was to give you the chart, it's actually trending above this. Uh, please, next slide. We also have a high pre-graduation placement average. Um, again, this is conservative. It's trending upward. Our, our stu the only thing that would limit our students from not getting a job within four weeks is that they don't want to move away from home. If they're willing to move just to the next town or the next county, uh, where the safety profession has been experiencing about a 10-year hiring shortage. Even with this many students with internships, we still turn away one to two dozen companies who want interns. We just don't have students to fill. So we're very privileged in that. The average starting salary is conservative. It is trending above that. Over the summer, uh, the average was over 60. And the students are just doing really well. I think that says a lot to the possible return on investment for our degree. I've done some basic calculations. And our students, uh, the return on investment is anywhere from two to four years, depending on the level of their, of their loans. I just want to take a brief moment just to uh, mention a few companies that have been hiring our students, because I think it's interesting. 3M, Alliant Energy. Amazon, American Family Insurance, Bell's Brewery, Blattner Construction, Briggs & Stratton, Charter Steel, Colony Brands, Church Mutual, Crave Brothers Farmstead Cheese, Hooper Corporation, Husco International, Michaels Corporation, Mortensen Construction, Nestle, Palermo Vila, Oshkosh Corporation, Century Insurance, the Wisconsin Department of Administration, Walt Disney Company, we Energies and West Bend Insurance. This is a very small uh, portion of the greater list where our students are getting hired. Uh, next slide, please. If you can just sort of scroll through, I'm just going to mention a few things before I turn this over to uh, my advisee, uh, Siobhan. And that is our program is very much built up to be hands-on. Uh, we try to bring our students out into the community, and we do work here on campus. We've done things such as uh, we, we created safety orientation videos for Rosie Lane Holsteins up in Watertown, an English and a Spanish speaking safety orientation video. We've done air monitoring, noise monitoring for small companies that maybe can't afford to bring in a, a consultant, but our, our students get the experience. And also, we're doing this in multiple classes, and it's not just a single class anymore. We actually did uh, hazard communication and GHS training for our art department here on campus. So we're doing a lot to help out both campus and also the community. We also have great support, uh, and that's actually a testament to our alumni that uh, they want to hire our students, they want to mentor our students, they want to give them real world practice, real world projects. Uh, last year, Granger provided a $5,000 scholarship to one of our students, and our students also um, receive uh, a lot of uh, financial assistance through the uh, American Society of Safety Professionals and the Board of Certified Safety Professionals. Uh, the last thing, what I want to close with is uh, I want to thank uh, the College of Business and Economics, specifically uh, the technical support that has been so amazing to allow us to create these online degrees and online courses and to be able to bring more people to our degree. With that, I'll turn it over to Siobhan Cook. I am Siobhan Cook. I am an alumni of the undergrad program here at UW-Whitewater in the Safety and Health Department. And one of the things, um, so when I graduated from the Safety and Health Department, I attended during the early to mid-2000s. And one of the things that I really loved about the program was the fact that not only did it touch on all of those STEM subjects that I'm intrigued about, but it really brought this whole idea that I loved of teaching people how to not only look out for themselves, but how to take care of each other. And that was something that really attracted me to the program. So, And then all those subjects that came into it. So learning about fire prevention, industrial hygiene, ergonomics, industrial safety management, and all of the other uh, subjects that are covered within the program, those were really good things for me to learn and learn how to apply them in an occupational setting, in a manufacturing setting. 
when it came time for me to do my internship, I wanted to be able to take all of those skills that I learned, but also learn something more at the same time. And so that's what ended up leading me into risk management. So I did my internship uh, with an insurance agency out of Waukesha and learning all of those things in regards to risk control and risk management and how all of those things I learned in the program could apply to that type of a setting. I continued that journey on after my, I graduated in May of 2006 and worked for a couple of different insurance carriers. So went to the insurance carrier side uh, as a loss control rep, as a risk control consultant, and being able to do that assessment piece with safety management systems. After doing that for a couple of years, I decided I wanted to move into the manufacturing side. And so that's when I went into food manufacturing and now I got a chance to be a, um, first a uh, safety specialist and then eventually as a safety manager and now actually getting to do that day in and day out uh, activities with managing a safety management system and really creating that impact with the employees in regards to how they can be safe for themselves, how they can take care of each other and really impact that safety culture. I was fortunate enough in 2013, that's when OSHA came out with their temporary worker initiative, and I was recruited by a staffing company um, to help and basically build their safety management system from scratch. So me and three other professionals built all of the programs, policies, training, not only for the temporary employees, but also for the internal staff, and then built uh, an assessment system to go out to those customers who wanted to use temporary employees and make sure that they were taking care of our people the way that they needed to and that we were all on the same page. Um, so then that was really a in very interesting experience because now I got to build something from the ground up and be proud of the system that we put together and spend about five years working for them. And all of those experiences led me to my current career working for the Wisconsin Safety Council and now I get to teach uh, other safety professionals and those who just want to be safety leaders in their organization on all of those different things that I had learned in my career over the years. And all throughout uh, this journey, I've been doing as much as possible to promote the program. Um, I've had the chance to hire safety professionals at some of my jobs and so I tend to be a little biased and look for the ones that have the UW-Whitewater degree behind their names first because I know that the quality of the program has given them the skills that they need that they would be successful in the jobs that we were trying to hire them for. Um, what I also realized as I was working for the Safety Council is that I was teaching these great programs, but I wanted to be able to add more depth to them um, and more knowledge than just what those programs were providing by the National Safety Council. And so that actually brought me back. So even though I'm an alum, I am also currently in the master's program. I had been hearing about it for a long time, and especially once I heard about it being online, uh, I knew that that was going to work well for me, um, fit in with my career, with the hours that I had, be able to fit in with my growing family that I had going on at the time. Um, and it's really provided that additional education and knowledge that I needed so that I could then spread that information to those who were coming and trying to learn how they can themselves could be effective safety professionals uh, at the jobs that they are working at. Um, so I am fortunate to say that I will be graduating from the program uh, in May of this year, or May of 2020, I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm also excited to say that I'm now going on to my next chapter. I love teaching so much that I am going to be working for Madison Area Technical College uh, starting in January and trying to get them built up and, and get their safety classes uh, to benefit those students that are in various trade programs uh, at their organization. So um, the experiences I've had here have been tremendous. I promote UW-Whitewater to pretty much anyone who is interested in any kind of a career. There's so many different ways that you can go with this program. Um, there's no way to get bored. It's, it's a fun, challenging uh, type of environment to work in. And it is kind of a secret. I think I was lucky in that I have a, I have a mom who works here. Um, so that's how I knew about the program. Um, but I really try and promote it to others. Uh, you know, some of the younger people who are thinking, I don't know which direction to go in, and try and get them to think of this as a really good option to at least take a look at, start with some of those beginner classes and see if it's something that might be intriguing. So I'm very thankful. I thank UW-Whitewater for all of the uh, knowledge and experience that they've provided to me and helped me to be successful in this career. Thank you. Again, inspired. Thank you. We were, uh, we were excited about the future of this whole uh, this program and what it holds. 
UW-Whitewater has a long history of having a strong department of political science. Graduates have become elected officials at all levels of government. They also serve as staff members. Some go on to be city managers. Others choose law enforcement or attend law school. I'd like to introduce the chair of the Department of Political Science, Associate Professor Dr. Jolly Emery, to discuss how the Department of Political Science is helping to shape the future of our region, state, and union, and nation. Chancellor, and good afternoon. It started under our former dean, now provost at UW Parkside. I'm sorry, Parkside, wow. I knew I was going to trip over something. River Falls, sorry, <laughs> Provost Travis, um, that chairs had to attend all preview days here on campus. At preview days, I'm frequently asked by prospective parents and their students, what can you do? with a political science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater? This is a very good question, and this is a question, as a chair, you need to be prepared to answer. Because I firmly believe that no one tells our story better than our alumni and our students, this is what I say. Next slide, please. If you want to make a difference at the local level and go into local politics, you can become a county administrator like Joshua Schumann, who's county administrator right now for Washington County, Wisconsin, and Ben Waymire, who's county administrator for Jefferson County, Wisconsin. Next slide, please. If you want to go into state politics, you can become a state senator, like Senator Steve Knoth in the center, or you can become speaker of the Wisconsin State Assembly with a degree from the political science department at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Next slide, please. Let's say you're very ambitious. You can become Chief of Staff to the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, or Chief of Staff to the President of the United States with a degree from the Department of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Next slide, please. What if you want to go into the private sector? Well, like Paul Jones, you can be Vice President and Chief Legal Counsel of Harley Davidson Incorporated. Now, full disclosure, because he is an attorney, he did resign from this position last week, but you can still become. There's an opening, yeah, yeah, I have to let my grads know. Um, next slide, please. And more recently, in the center is Ali Andrew. The chancellor mentioned LEAP, which is a very important program here at UW-Whitewater. Ali Andrew was in our first cohort of Legal Eagles, a learning community in the Department of Political Science. Currently, she's a practicing attorney She's in mergers and acquisitions at the firm of Myron Brown, a top 20 international law firm in the city of Chicago. And next to her is Kayla Keach. Last year, as a senior, Kayla Keach interned in the Office of the Parliamentarian for the House of Representatives of the US Congress. And recently, she accepted a position with the US Food and Drug Administration. Next slide, please. In the center, in that large group photo, and in the center of that large group photo wearing the shirt that says Sonia, is Kayla White. Kayla White, as a senior, interned with the American Civil Liberties Union in Milwaukee. She was so successful as an intern there that she was invited to be an observer by an attorney with the ACLU at last year's presidential election in El Salvador. She was so successful at that opportunity that this summer she worked with a human rights organization in El Salvador and her work included acting as a legal assistant to a firm that is arguing a case before the El Salvador Supreme Court. And in the picture on the right, those four students there, oh, by the way, 
legal eagle. All of these have been legal eagles. So learning communities matter. Hips matter. The four students there, they are currently in their third year at Wisconsin Law. Three of the four are on law review, which is a very distinctive honor. Of the three, two are editors. The fourth is on Wisconsin Law's International Law Journal. Next slide, please. And finally, to close the loop, as our provost like, likes to say, as part of LEAP, we have Tommy Jones. Everything starts here as a student. And Tommy Jones was a student regent on the UW Board of Regents. He is currently um, external affairs director for the Department of Parks and Recreation in Washington, D.C. Last but not least, I also have to mention Carrie Heinrich, who is chief of staff to the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. So this is what you can do with a political science degree <laughs> from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emery. It's impressive, very impressive. We have much to be proud of at the university. And these are just a few of the points of pride that help make UW-Whitewater so unique. Although we are proud, we still have work to do. Our preliminary 10-day census data shows we have about 12,400 students enrolled at both campuses for the 2019-20 year. Students recognize our great value and the high quality education we offer along with excellent student support. Graduate and online programs continue to see growth with an increase in students this year. Our online programs have been ranked in the top 10 in the nation. Like all of our system campuses, we do have challenges. One of the most critical challenges is enrollment. In recent years, enrollment has dropped and as you saw earlier, we had a stellar, uh, outstanding record number of student graduates. While that was outstanding, having more students earn degrees and leave does not impact enrollment in the bottom line. UW Whitewater is more dependent on tuition revenue than ever. The financial health depends on increasing enrollment. When the decrease in enrollment appeared to be more than a one year blip, student steps were taken to examine the issues and actions were set into motion to level off enrollment. We're taking concrete steps to increase our enrollment. In the spring of 2018, UW-Whitewater began the strategic enrollment plan and involved more than 100 people from across both campuses. This process resulted in action plans that we believe will help create a stable enrollment environment. Visits to campus during the summer months increased more than, more, by more than 600 people. Interest in preview days, tours, and other traditional fall events from prospective students continue to, to build. The increase in visits to, is a good indication that people are interested in all that UW-Whitewater has to offer. We believe those who visit UW-Whitewater will experience the campus with highly engaged and welcoming faculty and staff who do deeply care about student success. The fact that our campus is located in a beautiful and supportive community helps as well. UW-Whitewater prides itself on educating future leaders of the state of Wisconsin and beyond. That desire to educate as many students as possible is, the co is core to who we are at UW-Whitewater. In April, more than 1,000 of the most talented public speakers from across the United States will meet on our campus for the National Forensic Association Championship Tournament. About 70 teams from California to New York are expected to attend and compete in 12 different speeches and debate events. This is an extraordinary honor for our campus. Our gift to all of you for attending our meeting is an experience, an opportunity to sample what it will take to be, what will take place here in April. It is my pleasure to introduce Jenny Tooney. Jenny Toon is a senior of the water forensic team and currently serves as the team president. She is majoring in communication sciences and, and disorder. To date, she has earned more than three, 30 awards nationally for her performance in forensics and is a role model for younger students on the team. 
Guinea will be performing a prose interpretation, which is the retelling of a true story with a relevant social message. The story gives us the perspectives on privilege, the privileges that we have, and the fact that with much privilege comes responsibility. So in order to do this, I'm going to invite those who are sitting here to move to sitting over there. And then we're going to open up so Jenny could move into the inside. All right. Thank you for, for all of this orchestration. Jenny, why don't you move on to the inside, and they'll come and sit there. Thank you. Whenever someone tells me not to do something, it always makes me really want to do it. <laughs> um, I've used that a lot in my adult life because I've spent most of it traveling to some of the world's most dangerous, inhospitable places. Now, doing these trips, I frankly wouldn't wish it on anyone. Uh, for example, kayaking 600 miles alone to Timbuktu. Now, I first got into this line of work when I was 20 writing what I saw for magazines or books. But solo backpacking around Europe, it was the first time in my life I found something I could do. See, back then I didn't really have a lot of confidence, but then I started traveling alone and I just got hooked. You know, I got hooked on this empowerment of having to get from one place to another. And I just wanted to find harder and harder places to go. I just wanted more and more challenges. So I bought a one-way ticket to Central Africa. I mean, there I was, this 20-year-old blonde-haired girl in a tie-dye t-shirt living out of her backpack. <laughs> but it was the first time in my life I felt joy from doing something. Oh, don't get me wrong, I mean, it was hard. It was tough. But this exhilarated me, and I needed that because I'd suffered from severe depression for most of my life. It was just, it was just kind of tedious being alive, but, oh, but traveling through Africa. And, and now it might have been enough for some people to just go to Kenya, do a safari, but no, I had my sights set on Mozambique, which, note, was in the middle of this 17-year-long civil war. But like, I really wanted to see it, okay? And, and nothing was actually stopping me from going except just the logistics of how to actually enter the country. But then I learned about this road. It was called the Boneyard Stretch. See, it cuts straight through the war zone from Malali to Zimbabwe, and I just needed to find a driver who would take me, but of course they all thought I was a complete lunatic. Until I met Jerry. Uh, Jerry, the, uh, the first thing he did was take me around to the side of his truck, and he showed me these dings. He said, those are bullet holes. He said he needed me to know that this war, it, it was real. That, that there was a chance we could get ambushed or worse. And that the fuel injector in his truck might break. Now intellectually, I, I understood this was extremely dangerous. But in our world, I mean, people's tragedies and their wars, I mean, they're reduced to our Sunday night movies. So. I just didn't really understand what this reality of war meant. So I still just said, yeah. Yeah, I still want to go. Early the next morning, Jerry was blasting Bob Marley out of his truck windows when all of a sudden I couldn't figure out what I was doing. I mean, I was there in their war, this 20-year-old blonde American girl. Like, what in the world was I doing? And, you know, as we were driving along, we passed this group of government soldiers, and they couldn't believe their eyes either. Uh, but Jerry, he told me, just keep looking out those windows to see if I saw any rebel soldiers hiding in the brushes. 
you know, these weren't soldiers by any sense of our idea of the word soldier. These were just children. 14-year-olds with AK-47s, his truck lurched. The fuel injector broke. His car died. I started hearing the sound of this engine roaring down the road. I started shaking uncontrollably, and in that moment, I realized how fragile human life was, and, and for the people living in this country, I mean, they had to deal with that sort of fear and uncertainty on a daily basis, and then this was a group of the rebel soldiers, the, the adolescents with assault rifles. You know, Jerry explained to me very quickly that in a place like this, if they wanted something, they'll just take it. So Jerry was left behind, and I was taken to this dilapidated building right off the border post to Zimbabwe. But they took me in this room, and they sat me on a bench. You know, they tried to scare me by throwing bottles, and I just couldn't stop thinking about how if I died, if, no, if I was killed, no one back home would have any idea what had happened to me. So I just needed to move, you know, I, I just needed to think. So I just asked one of the soldiers where the bathroom was, and he pointed me in this tiny closet with a broken window. But through that window, I saw this tiny bead of light. You know, but it was, it was nighttime, so I knew, okay, I knew that had to be electricity and that, that it was probably coming from the border post to Zimbabwe. You know, if I could just get across that border, I would be safe. So I made the split decision to just, just run. I just ran straight out their front door and into the night. You know, I could hear all the soldiers coming after me, but I figured I'd just find a place, hide out during the night, then I could make it to the border post in the morning. And, and that's what I did. I grew up overnight. In that single night, I realized this reality for millions of people. And the sort of violence and barbarity that they have to live with, I felt obligated to share that with the world, you know? I mean, you would think after an experience like that, I would never want to do these trips again. But it did the opposite. I was willing to take a calculated risk, not a blind risk anymore, but a calculated one if I felt like I could bring back their realities and allow other people to see what they have to live with. I realized that my life, it, it really did matter to me after all. I understood that I had done everything in my power to escape from that situation because I wanted my life. And in that, I wanted to be alive. Wow, inspired. Thank you, Jenny. What a wonderful example of the sorts of skills and talents held by our amazing students. I'm looking forward to partaking in some of these events in April. We have one final piece we'd like to share with you, but before we do that, we'd like to ask President Cross to come to the podium. <laughs> this is very impromptu for him. <laughs> President Cross, we cannot allow this opportunity to pass without recognizing you and your outstanding achievements. I believe I speak for everyone in this room when I say thank you for your service to the UW system. We have a gift that we hope reminds you of your service, not only to the university you serve, but also the service to our country. Our talented campus photographer, Craig Schreiner, captured this photo
captured this photo of our Army ROTC cadets. Um, we want you to accept this gift as a small token of our appreciation for your leadership, your inspiration, your friendship, your service, and your generous spirit. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll put it here. All right. made a fatal mistake. You don't oh, give me that. There you go. <laughs> uh, the theme for this meeting is inspirational. And I was thinking while Jenny was telling that, it, 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 <clears throat> what we don't often get to see is the talent that is developed in a student. And what I would like to see is how she would have given that, that speech when she was a freshman. I would like to have seen the difference because the delta is enormous and it's very inspirational from all of what we've heard and so we appreciate that very much Dwight and, and that was a speech that I wasn't supposed to make either so <laughs> I, I do want to thank you for this but uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of Whitewater's success too thank you so much and finally we, we leave you with a video that highlights our 150 years of dedication to student success. Please enjoy the video. This is such an amazing place. It's weathered so many storms. I've seen it transformed from a good, good university into a leader in the nation. Over that 150 years, the amount of impact that we've had as a university has been tremendous. This campus inspired me from the very first time I stepped foot on. There was just a sense about it. There's people from all different walks of life here at Whitewater, I really feel as if everybody is proud to be a Warhawk. Our success was their success, and that inspired me. It is very clear to me that they can compete with anyone from any university because they have a great foundation that's been given to them. We will take you by the hand to help you, but also to challenge you. And I think taking the risks of trying new things they pushed excellence in academics. They pushed excellence in service. They pushed excellence in involvement. It was always a matter of, you're here for a greater good. And they lived it. They showed us that, not just their words, but their actions. I want to actually feel like we're in this together. And the way to do that is not to treat students like numbers, but to treat them like people. You're more than just your GPA. We want you to leave as this whole person. My job is to challenge students. My job is to make them think. All of us work at making sure that students succeed, that student success is what we put front and center of what we do every day. And so student success is really seeing them for who they are, what they bring to the table already, and where they want to go. Whitewater gave me a brilliant undergraduate foundation. It absolutely prepared me for my future educational endeavors in graduate school and law school and beyond. And I see that every commencement, the joy, um, the pride, even people I don't know walking across the stage gets me choked up. I think that's what makes UW-Whitewater a unique place, is that everyone is passionate about what they do, and that's supporting students and helping students thrive. When they graduate, it's their job to take their story and go share it with the world. I feel that as we build a community here in Whitewater and we spread out to the world, we are also building a community around the world with the same values that we develop here. So we give them those chances. It's given me a sense of what it really means to be a part of an institution, of higher education, that really stands for something. One of our strengths at Whitewater 
is that our students want to engage in the community. We have students who are influencing public policy, working in business, where they're working in the public sector. I think students that come out of the university embrace the possibilities of change and in fact can be agents of change. And engagement is about being there, being present in the moment um, and seeing what's good and seeing what needs to change. For me, Whitewater has been transformational. To see them bloom as they live here in this community at UW Whitewater is absolutely inspirational. Leading Purple, we're really talking about being successful and exceptional in everything that we do. I believe with all my heart and soul that it means something to be a Warhawk. There's a responsibility there to the common good and to the concept of excellence and not to reflect back on the university, but to make a difference in the world and to make the world a better place. Um, yeah, the hairstyles are different and the clothes are different, but the people are the same. They invest in one another, and I think that's a huge legacy that we at UW Whitewater have for one another. This is what we do here. And I do believe that the scale of the university, its geopolitical position in the world and in Wisconsin, are all tremendous attributes to keep that university moving forward. I think they're very well positioned to take students and the university itself many more decades into the future. Looking at 150 years, it's a legacy of service, of creating and building opportunities for people to be exceptional, educated, and then move outward to impact the world. see there is much in our past, our present, and our future that enables UW Whitewater to inspire, engage, and transform. I'll now open it up to the Board of Regents for comments or questions of me or any of our panelists or presenters. Now all, all of our presenters are still sitting there, so call them forward if you need to. Questions of members of the Board of Regents? Regent Klein. Yes, um, thank you for this great presentation, Chancellor Watson. It was very informative and um, a lot of work and just it was energizing and inspiring. Um, question for you, um, now you've been on campus, is it almost six months? Um, what do you think are the biggest areas of opportunity? Yeah, when I came here, I said, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna learn, and then I'll lead. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, listening and learning a lot, and my head is full, and uh, I'm, I'm absorbing a lot. Uh, the one thing I wanted to make sure that everybody understood is that this is a quality place, this is a wonderful place, and I wanted to enter in uh, through a lens of celebration and not a, le a lens of problematizing. Now there's things to be done, and we're gonna get to those things, but we're gonna get to them in a, sted in a steady, cadent sort of way. <coughs> I'm here to offer stability and to be here uh, for the long run. And so what I find when I came here is that the community and the people, they're ready to engage, connect, and do the rich work of the institution. And it's a wonderful place to be and to be able to have that, that sort of visceral support on a daily basis. Um, this could not have happened without that sort of visceral support and collaboration, and that's, that's the spirit of UW-Whitewater. Yes. Regent Stanford Taylor. Chancellor Watson, I just want to thank you and staff 
faculty and students for that awesome presentation and showing many facets of what's offered here at Whitewater. But I appreciate the point of showing your connection to K-12 as well. And for those of you who don't know, we have a great partnership for our two state school, the School for the Blind in Janesville and the School for the Deaf in Delavan. So I appreciate all that Whitewater does. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Manatees. Thank you. Chancellor, I appreciate your acknowledging the history of these lands that this campus is built on and following through with that idea that is here prior to your coming. Uh, I hope that you know that that means a lot to uh, the people that the tribes, the sovereign nations in this state and everywhere. It's further evidence that they are uh, people that existed and have existed and still exist and are important. So thanks. Thank you, Regent Manny Deeds. Regent Hall. Yes, I'd like to take a moment to brag that Tommy was my student that was <laughs> in it. And, and when I look at it, you know, um, I'm always speaking about the importance of pre-college programming. He was part of my pre-college program here at UW-Whitewater. So it was that exposure that helped to make a difference. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Regent Hall. I'd like to ask the young lady with the forensics presentation, did you actually take that trip? <laughs> well, you completely had me convinced that it was <laughs> you. I going to ask if you were all right. Thank you, Regent Wall. Other questions of the Regents? Well, let me just say on behalf of your faculty, your staff, your students, this was an exceptional presentation and really showed us and showcased for us all of the wonderful things happening on this campus. You've been here six months. It looks like you've been here an eternity. Congratulations, <laughs> Chancellor Watson. All right. this time, this concludes our uh, <coughs> afternoon's public meeting, and I would ask all board members to stay in place while we complete the roll call to move it into closed session. We'll then wait until the room is cleared and get our work underway. Vice President Grieby, will you please read the motion to move us into closed session this afternoon? I move that the Board of Regents move into closed session. <clears throat> To A, consider a student request for review of a UW-Madison decision as permitted by Section 1985-1AF and G of the Wisconsin Statutes. Consider a student request for review of a UW-Oshkosh disciplinary decision as permitted by Section 1985-1AF and G of the Wisconsin Statutes. Consider personnel evaluations of chancellors as permitted by Section 1985-1C of the Wisconsin statutes, consider compensation adjustments for chancellors as permitted by section 1985-1C of the Wisconsin statutes, consider compensation adjustments for individuals with salaries that exceed 75% of the UW system president's salary as permitted by section 1985-1C of the Wisconsin statutes, consider four UW-Milwaukee honorary degree nominations as permitted by section 1985-1F of the Wisconsin statutes. Deliberate or negotiate the pu purchase of public property for UW Stevens Point as permitted by section 1985-1E of the Wisconsin statutes. Confer with legal counsel regarding potential litigation in which it is likely to become involved regarding contracts as permitted by section 1985-1G of the Wisconsin statutes and discuss ongoing personnel matters as permitted by section 1985-1F of the Wisconsin statutes. We have a motion, may I have a second? second. Thank you. <laughs> Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes. Yes. Regent Bechtel. Yes. Regent Delgado. Yes. Regent Delgado. Yes. <laughs> Regent Hall. Here. Regent Jones. Here. Regent Klein. Yes. 
Yeah. Regent Levzo? Yes. Regent Many Yes. Yeah. Regent Mueller? Yes. Yeah. Regent Peterson? Yes. Yeah. Regent Font? Yes. Yeah. Regent Stanford Taylor? Regent Tiedemann? Yes. Yeah. Regent Walsh? Yes. Yeah. Regent Whitburn? Yes. Yeah. Regent Woodmansey? Yes. Yeah. We're in closed session. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't we wait for the room to clear? People need a uh, health break. Please take it now. We've got a very full agenda this afternoon.